And it's so unfortunate that I, all of those years, you know, it happened like that. And we would have never thought, when, when the first album came out, I would have never thought that we would end up not being together. For as long as any of us could remember, music has always been known to follow popular trends that most groups conform to in order to try and achieve mainstream success. From fashion to personas, to an artist's appearance, record labels are commonly known to put pressure on their artists to do whatever it takes to help them sell. One of the most common acts that have become a staple in the music industry are American boy bands and girl groups. Although these acts wouldn't become extremely popular until the 1960s to 70s, people like the Shirelles, the Jackson 5, and the Supremes are only but a few of the many bands and groups formed during this time that have achieved mainstream success. However, as much money as the label makes from the work of a group, they make twice, even more, if one of the group members goes solo, especially the crowd favorite. What's going on, YouTube? This is True Young of Truth Nation, and today we're going to discuss when artists go solo, the backlash, success, and stress of leaving the group. Let's get into it. Welcome to Truth Nation. Viewer discretion is advised. Typically, the reason why most artists go solo from their group is because they are always at the forefront. Time and time again, there are groups made only for one person to stand out the most. Whether it's because of the management, the popularity, or the exceeding talent, there's always that one person that everyone has their eyes set on. As previously stated, the Supremes were very popular during the 1960s, becoming one of Motown Records' biggest acts to make it mainstream during that time along with the Jackson 5, Smokey Robinson and the Miracles, Stevie Wonder, Marvin Gaye, and many more. Starting off as the Permettes, and then at one point being called the No-Hit Supremes, members Mary Wilson, Florence Ballard, who was later replaced by Cindy Birdsong in 1967, and Diana Ross would not see any success as a group until their 1964 breakthrough hit, Where Did I Love Go? The song catapulted the group onto the map of other established groups in their field, such as the Beatles, staying at number one on the Billboard Hot 100 for two weeks and stayed in the top 10 for nine more weeks. After that, the Supremes would release hit after hit, earning the record of having the most number ones on the Billboard Hot 100, an impressive 12 hit songs from any girl group since 1969, which is still yet to be broken. However, despite their massive success, it wouldn't be until that same year that Diana Ross would choose to go solo. In interviews, Diana would say that she never wanted to leave the group. Rather, she was forced out, receiving treatment from the group that left her heartbroken when she started to sing front and center. However, the harsh departure from the group did not stop Diana from having the legendary career that she did achieving 12 top 10 hit songs on the Billboard Hot 100, six peaking at number one, such as Upside Down, Endless Love, and Love Hangover. After releasing her final studio album on the Real Town Records in 1999, Diana planned to go on tour the following year. It wasn't until a close friend of hers, Scott Sanders, suggested that she add her former bandmates to the lineup. After pulling a few strings and heavy promotion, the Supremes to reunite after years of disbandment in the year 2000 on the Return to Love tour, and since then have had a more or less cordial relationship amongst one another. Though there wasn't any extreme drama upon his departure from his family band, or at least nothing that the public knows, Michael Jackson, of course, was to go on to become the legendary, iconic, inspiring musician and the best entertainer of all time. However, during his childhood, Michael and his siblings were put through rigorous and agonizing abuse while doing rehearsals with their father. A lot of the pressure was on to Michael especially, not only because he was the youngest in the band, but he was also one of the lead vocalists. After signing with Motown Records in 1968, the group found a lot of success, spawning many hits that topped the charts like ABC, I'll Be There, and I Want You Back. 
1977, the group was able to sell out shows and receive numerous awards throughout their active years and even later was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1997 and the Vocal Group Hall of Fame in 1999. Michael would inevitably become known as the King of Pop by releasing masterpieces back to back throughout his career and staying on top of the charts consistently in weeks upon end. Earning 13 number one hits to his name and six number one albums, it's safe to say that albums like Thriller, Bad, and Invincible will forever be a part of the music conversation. By the early 90s, the rest of the group had went on to do their own things, but being that they were family, of course they never lost touch with one another. Here's a quick rundown of what the other members of the Jackson 5 were up to after their disbandment. Jermaine Jackson, the other lead vocalist in the band, had gone solo around the same time his brother did and was able to achieve solo success on his own throughout the 70s and 80s, topping the R&B charts with hits such as Don't Take It Personal, Let's Get Serious, and Dynamite. Jackie Jackson, one of the group's tambourines, also released solo work apart from the band. His self-titled album and sophomore album, Be The One, was released 16 years from one another, and unfortunately, it failed to make noise. Tito Jackson, the lead guitarist, would not release any of his solo music until 2016 in August of 2021. Randy Jackson, who played the percussion, has not been active in the music industry since the 90s when he formed his own band called Randy and the Gypsies, released one studio album and then disbanded. And finally, Marlon, the group's other tambourine, had by this time quit music altogether and began to invest in real estate. As we all know, the sudden passing of Michael Jackson in 2009 would become a shock to the entire world, and surely was especially hard for the rest of the Jackson family. Since then, many artists have performed tributes to the legendary performer, including members of his own family. In August of 2011, the plans of a tribute concert to their late brother was planned, but had started to fall apart as the brothers seemed to have had little disputes behind the scenes causing the first show to go on without Randy. However, the Jacksons as a band wouldn't have their own unity tour until 2012 and would perform around the United States until the following year. Fast forward to the 90s, where hip hop culture seemed to have taken the media by storm. Numerous rap groups and talents had come up from underground freestyle sessions and began to top the billboard charts like pop stars. Acts like Junior Mafia, Naughty by Nature, 36 Mafia, and Salt and Pepper are just a few to name who've achieved much success during their time. One of the few groups that was able to establish a legend off of one album, however, was the Fugees. Lauren Hill had always been a natural performer. By age 13, she participated in many talent shows at her school and even performed on national TV at the Apollo Theater, where she was unfortunately booed at by a crowd of arguably immature and grown adults. By high school, Lauren Hill had formed a band with her fellow classmates, Praz and Wyclef Jean, going by the name Fugees, which derived from the word refugees. In 1994, after a year of studying at Columbia University, Lauren decided to fully dedicate herself to her music, and the Fugees released their debut album, Blunted on Reality, under Rough House Records, which was distributed through Columbia Records. The album consisted of 18 tracks, and although it received mostly favorable reviews by the general public, it did not equate to sales. The album's biggest hit single, Nappy Heads peaked at number 49 on the Billboard Hot 100 and the album overall peaked at number 62 on the R&B Hip Hop Albums charts. It wouldn't be until their sophomore album, The Score, that the group would receive immense acclaim and be named as one of the most iconic rap groups of all time, spawning hit singles like No Woman, No Cry, Ready or Not, Killing Me Softly, and Fuji La. Although it was the last album the group would release as a trio, the production of the album almost didn't happen. 
if not for Chris Schwartz, the head of Rough House, giving the three complete artistic control and $135,000 in advance, the group might not have been able to have the funds to make such a masterpiece. Following the album's success in 1997, each group member had begun their own solo endeavors. Radcliffe Jean had made a name for himself as a hit maker, producing many numerous catchy records for acts like Shakira, Whitney Houston, and Destiny's Child. He then released his own studio album, Radcliffe Jean Presents the Carnival in 1997, receiving critical acclaim and spawned the top 10 hit Gone Till November, selling over 50,000 copies in its first week and peaking at number 16 on the Billboard 200. It was safe to say Wyclef was no one to play with. Proz would release his own solo album in 1998, Ghetto Superstar, which spawned a top 40 hit of the same name with Maya and Old Dirty Bastard, another debut album I'm sure many would like to have. The group will come back together once more in February of 1998 to make a song for the Sesame Street soundtrack special, Elmo Palooza, before Lauren would make her debut after later that year. I think it's safe to say everyone who listens to rap and hip hop knows about this album. Lauryn Hill's debut and only studio album, The Miseducation of Lauryn Hill, broke numerous records and brought in critical acclaim around the world. It sold over 4,200,000 copies in its first week, which broke the record for the first week sales by a female artist and to this day by any female rapper and debuted at number one on the Billboard 200. The album is a non-skippable. It went on to sell millions of copies in less than a month. It won her five Grammys in one night, breaking another record for winning the most Grammys in one night by a female artist at that time, one of them being Album of the Year, which also made it the first hip-hop album to receive the award. What's sad to hear is that during their time in the group, Lauren and Wyclef were seeing each other and once the group started to fall apart, so did their relationship. Despite Wyclef's wishes, Following the success of her work, Lauren went on to work with talented and respected acts in the industry such as Aretha Franklin, Mary J. Blige, and many more. After releasing an acoustic live recorded album on MTV in 2002, Lauren saw fit to take a break from her music career indefinitely. To put it briefly, Lauren ultimately chose to leave music in the industry due to its shady dealings and also to tend to her family. As a group, the Fugees were able to become one of the most iconic hip-hop groups of all time and despite their harsh departure over the years, Proz, Wyclef, and Lauren have seemed to squash whatever issues they had and reunite to perform together here and there. Lauren still does concerts to this day, some taking place at the Apollo, and has recently announced a reunion tour in honor of the 25th anniversary of her group's sophomore album, The Score. What a full circle moment. By the end of the 90s decade, every teenager in America either had a crush on or wanted to be just like a member from a popular girl group or a boy band due to the mass uprise of the trend. From Boys to Men to TLC, young American bands took over the radio and television ways with their fresh futuristic style and synchronized choreography. Amongst those bands that received mainstream success was Destiny's Child. Despite popular belief, most of the members in the group were able to achieve mild success in their solo endeavors. Final members Kelly Rowland, Beyonce Knowles, and Michelle Williams went on to have great solo careers in their own right and garnered supporters outside of the group. As a child, Beyonce was the quiet and shy type. She didn't have many friends at school, and her parents tried their best to help their oldest daughter socially. It wasn't until they signed her up for a dance class that Tina and Matthew Knowles saw that their child had a lot of potential as a performer. From that point on, Beyonce was placed in many talent shows and won a lot of the competitions. By 1990, her father auditioned her for a spot on a group called Girls Time, during which she would meet two other girls around her age, Latavia Robertson and Kelly Rowland. Latavia auditioned to be a rapper and dancer in the group, while Kelly would audition to be a singer and dancer, along with Beyonce and the other girls. All three made it into the group. Girls Time got a lot of attention and managed to perform on America's greatest talent competition at that time, Star Search. Unfortunately, the girls did not win the competition because of their song choice according to Matthew Knowles, 
who took the opportunity to manage the girl group and make changes to guarantee success. The group was then cut down to four, taking out three of the original members and adding in Latoya Luckett in 1993. After this, Matthew put the girls through rigorous training and rehearsals to enhance their stamina and vocal abilities. Going by destiny for a while, the girls first signed under Electra Records, but later were dropped before they could even release an album. Now as the group's manager, Matthew spent a lot of time trying to get them a record deal, even quitting his job as a salesman, which put money-making responsibilities to his wife, Tina. The two of them separated and had to make ends meet after moving out of their family house. In 1996, Tina decided on the group's next and final name change, Destiny's Child, after reading the words from a passage in the Bible. Then, Matthew finally negotiated a record deal for the girls under Columbia Records. Things were starting to look up for the group as they started to prepare the release of their debut album. Their first single, No No No, was the lead of their self-titled, but wouldn't make a lot of noise until Wyclef Jean of the Fugees made a remix to it. Their self-titled album was released to mostly positive reviews and still received mild success. In 1999, Destiny's Child released their second album, The Writings on the Wall, which would be when the girls as a group would see commercial accolades and praise. The album's first single, Bills, 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 went number one on the Billboard Hot 100, and the album peaked at number five on the Billboard 200. During the height of their career, the group went through a lot of stress and turmoil publicly and behind closed doors. Group members Latoya and Latavia were threatened to leave the group, claiming they weren't as favored in the group and claim to have gotten the short end of funds. Although they didn't intend to actually leave the group, Destiny's Child pursued with the promotion of their sophomore album once they released a video for their second single, Say My Name. So much can be said about this song. Some people say it's the group's biggest hit to date. Others say it's the shadiest move ever done by a girl group. But ultimately, the music video for Say My Name featured two new additions to the group. Michelle Williams and Farrah Franklin, singing over the record vocals of the previous members. Once they found out, along with the rest of the world, Latoya and Latavia filed a lawsuit against Matthew Knowles and their former bandmates as a breach of partnership and fiduciary duties. Because Beyonce was usually front and center most of the time, the media's comments about why the group split fell onto her. Everyone blamed Beyonce because her father was the manager and tied negative rumors to her, saying she was the mean one of the group. This put Beyonce through moments of depression, locking herself in her room and not eating for days after losing two of her closest friends. Later, the group continued to do press tours and after only five months, Farrah Franklin decided to leave the group. Regardless of what seemed like losses, Destiny's Child was destined to do great things. Brother, this guy stinks! After the rollout of the writings on the wall and being opening acts for stars like Britney Spears, Christina Aguilera, and TLC, Destiny's Child would release their third studio album, Survivor, in 2001. The album spawned three top 10 hit singles and became the group's best selling project, with over 660,000 sales in its first week. After that, the members took a hiatus planning to start their solo careers. Michelle was the first of any Destiny's Child member to drop with her contemporary gospel album, Heart to Yours, in 2002. The album was very successful on the gospel and R&B charts, becoming the best-selling gospel album of that year and also led Billboard to name Michelle as one of the top gospel artists of 2002, along with acts like Mary Mary, Kirk Franklin, and many more. Kelly would be the next to release music later that year, also dabbling in a few acting gigs. Before the release of her debut, Rowling collaborated with rapper Nelly on Dilemma, which not only became a worldwide hit, but also made Kelly Rowland the first Destiny's Child member to receive a Grammy and a Billboard Hot 100 number one hit apart from the group. To capitalize off of the song's success, she released Simply Deep, which made her career take off internationally once the album went number one in the UK. Lastly, Beyonce would release her highly anticipated debut album, Dangerously in Love, in 2003, becoming the most successful of the three debuts. 
It spawned two number one hit singles, Crazy in Love and Baby Boy, and two other top 10 hit singles, Me, Myself and I, and Naughty Girl. The album made her amongst the few female artists to win the most Grammys in one night alongside Lauryn Hill at the time, and the group would come together one last time to produce once more studio album called Destiny Fulfilled, which marked the end of Destiny's Child and did so with a bang. Former members Latoya Luckett achieved success in her solo career when she released her debut self-titled album in 2006. The project debuted at number one on the Billboard 200 and made her and Beyonce the only members of Destiny's Child to have an album debut at the top spot. Latavia saw success in acting, appearing in various shows and movies such as The Real Housewife of Atlanta and J.F. Bailey's stage plays How to Love and Not My Family. She was supposed to release an album sometime in 2009, but it was never finished. And as far as Farah and her career, some say she's still trying to find her luggage. Since then, mostly everyone who was a part of Destiny's Child has made amends and have close family-like relationships with one another. Beyonce even gave a shout out to Latoya and Latavia during her speech at the Billboard Music Awards. When we think of the groups discussed in this video, we think of those that are iconic, legendary, and people who have paved the way for other groups to come up in later years. And let's not get it mistaken, the 21st century also spawned some amazing male and female groups that have also received commercial success. The 2000s were a time where R&B was the new pop. Everyone was trying to create that sound that most black artists had perfected years before while adding their own flair to it. However, not every group was able to make the crowd favorite, have a stellar, or at least commercial solo career. Thank you all for watching this video, and if you'd like for me to continue with another part to this series, please like, comment, and subscribe, and as well as turn on post notifications so you'll know when it comes up. That's all for now. Stay blessed. The, in writing the book, I tried to focus, and I said in the beginning, focus on the good things that happened in our career. And we, it was so many wonderful things. I'd rather not focus on the things that were difficult. Most of the things were difficult because that was part of working hard and making it, you have to, I mean, you know, making it work. So yeah, but I think walking in the dressing room with the girls not speaking to you when you got to go out on stage and sing, set me free, why don't you, babe? Yeah. I, think that's a, I think that's hard. <laughs> This concludes this experience of Truth Nation. Thank you for watching. Sorry,